Hi, my name is Arthur Fleming. Civil Rights Today presents. Today we're presenting the Pan-African Connection. And with me is? Akwete Tahimba. All right, all right. Akwete Tahimba. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing wonderful. And you? I'm doing great. Hey, you know what? Uh, I've always admired what you're doing here. Of, you know, I, you know you're, you're an asset to the community. And so before we talk about that, I want you to uh, tell us a little bit about Wait there. It's about you know, you know where you're from, where you you know how you come to be in this space. And so. mm -hmm. Sure, sure. And let me just say that I'm really thankful to be here and be able to share with you, Brother Fleming. And it's I've always admired your work in the community also. And so I know it ain't been it's, as you know it it uh, it can be challenging at times to uh, to organize and make sure you lift your people up. But it uh, the it's it's worth. It's worth it, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. organizing is, can be the most difficult work, right. but it is definitely the most rewarding for, for in the long term for our people. So thank you. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, moi. Um, of course, I was born in Waco, Texas, okay. right up the road, and uh, to a family of 10 children. And my parents were um, very hardworking people. Uh, my mother just passed last year, 97 years old, and uh, my father uh, passed 1999. But they were two very hardworking parents who raised 10 children, and you know, with um, very uh, core Christian values. Um, you know, just treat other people like you want right, to be treated, right. and uh, you know, you had to learn the Lord's Prayer mm -hmm. and all that good mm -hmm. stuff. But we were raised. Um, you know, uh, to understand where we come from. And they mm. definitely told us about our history and all of it. They didn't try to hide the, mm. the ugly parts of the history because those were the things that were going to keep us safe, you mm. know. For instance, my mother and them, they would tell us about very, uh, you know, tragic situations of people being lynched, people's ears being nailed mm. to a tree, just different, just things that we knew what we were dealing with. And we had to know that this is a system where everybody don't love you. Mm -hmm. You can't walk around in La La Land thinking that everybody loves you. Right. So, and you have to know how to adapt in this, you know, this environment. But you definitely have to know who you are and stand up for what's right. So, um, we were people, we were a family that was raised in the church. Um, and a lot of those values mm. uh, are in turn are, are yeah. our traditional African values and right. principles. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Would, would you say your parents were Pan Africanists, or would you say they I, were? I, at that point, they they did not know what they were. You know, they did not mm. use these these terms mm. that we use today. Right, right, right. But they understood that they were African people, and that Africa was their point of origin. Africa is. Um, where their ancestors were from, mm -hmm. and you know, all they had to do was, uh, you know, look in the mirror for one thing. Right. They were not in denial or ashamed right. of of being of their ancestry being descendants of African mm -hmm. people. And you know, as a lot of our people talk about, also because uh, a lot of our people, like my mother, used to say, "Well, my great great grandmother had some Indian blood in her." Well, right, right, coming yeah. to this country, you know, of course, uh, and and being enslaved and out from slavery, a lot of the indigenous people sheltered us. We married among them, mm -hmm. so we have that close close connection also with the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. So, uh, but primarily, even with that little drops here and there, they knew who they were, mm -hmm. and they knew that Africa was their point of origin, so. Well, what about your educational background? Just a little bit about uh, that. Well, I, I uh, you know, of course, left Waco and uh, went to community college here for two years, then transferred to University of North Texas. Okay. At that time, it was North Texas State University. Right, right. <laughs> right so, um, so then just kind of stayed around in Dallas, uh, met my husband, my late husband, Brother Bandeli Chahimba, uh, on a, at, I was taking some classes at North Lake College campus, met him, uh, he was passing out literature for an organization called All African People's Revolutionary Party, mm -hmm. which was a, definitely a Pan-African organization, where Kwame Ture, many of you may know him as Stokely Carmichael, was one of the leading organizers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we uh, didn't know, I didn't know nothing about 
not, none of that, right? Mm -hmm. I was this little bourgeois sister from Waco, Texas, who just wanted to get a job and be a part of the status quo, right, right, right. Uh, which is what we were trained to do, you know, to assimilate into this system right. and, and just be safe. But um, joining the black student organization on that college campus changed my whole life, my whole thinking, uh, that I had a higher responsibility, you know, historical responsibility to to try to liberate our people and change the conditions that we found ourselves in. So. Okay. Okay. So, so, so you met him, and and then you got into the uh, 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 pan pan African mindset. Mm -hmm. So, how did the pan African connection come about? This was uh, actually the vision of Vandelli, who was really a very um, very principled person and uh, we, we had study groups and he had been a member of this Pan-African organization and he actually lived it to the T. Some people just kind of in the organization, they study, they talk, you know, all this revolutionary mm -hmm. talk, mm -hmm. but no, this brother was, um, he was very serious and very committed and he lived this ideology, lived this, the, this, this uh, idea of, of a system mm -hmm. of void of any exploitation of any man or woman, right? So um, it was really his vision because he had, uh, he was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. So, and up East Coast and different areas, you have black bookstores, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so being a part of the Pan-African, uh, All African People's Revolutionary Party, and also traveling around, um, it inspired him. He saw that black bookstores were places where people came to organize and strategize. And even at one point, there was um, uh, the FBI and the CIA really targeted black bookstores right, because right, right. of the uh, work and organizing that would take place in these types of institutions. Mm -hmm. So uh, these were institutions where people came to get knowledge and information mm -hmm. about themselves to change the ideas from negative to positive. Because mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we've been taught to hate ourselves. So. Of course, uh, Black Images was the first black bookstore in Dallas, Texas, which was a model for other people to say, well, uh, you know, we can do this. You know, Emma can do it, we can do it. And we all work collectively. We were def definitely uh, different in our, 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 our objectives, but we all knew that bookstores were a place that people could come and organize and, and change the ideas. And, get people moving into a certain mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. you, you, okay, you mentioned the FBI, uh, CIA, so forth, coming to our community our bookstores, uh, ch checking people out. What type of difficulties did you all run into as far as putting uh, you know, this space together? You know what, um, for us, we were, uh, well, we started out in Lancaster Key Shopping Center, actually, our first uh, in 1989, and so we were there for six months. We moved to Beckley and Jefferson, uh, right across from, at that time, it was Bank of America on that corner. Mm -hmm. So, and we painted all of these wonderful quotes in the windows by Marcus Garvey and Kwame Nkrumah, and, and, and cars would almost get into accidents, just passing by, reading the signs, mm -hmm. right? Because we were right on that corner. So it was a very, um, I, I think it was a very revolutionary thing to do in Dallas mm -hmm. to create an institution with these this big sign that said Pan African right, connection. Right. It it definitely told who you were. You weren't trying to, uh, uh, you know, make it palatable to, mm -hmm. you know, different people. You were you came out letting people know who you were. Mm -hmm. So that was a statement of, of showing that we are, you know, of identity, really, telling who we were. What about pushback? You're getting pushback when you are with uh, You always get pushback, not only, you know, from a certain class of African people, but uh, from white folks, right, who would call you and say, uh, why are y'all having that Marcus Garvey program? He was this, he was that. As if we cannot choose our own heroes and right, sheroes. Right, so we right. would, see, hang up on them. Or, uh, and sometimes we would have people would break our windows, right? Whoa. Then the police would come in, because at one point we lived above our, we lived above our business. Okay. And, uh, so um, the police would come in after you call them and they would, didn't care mm -hmm. if somebody broke your window. They would be at one point, one time the police came in, I was there alone, uh, after somebody broke the window in the middle of the night. And uh, 
so he was going through our clothes. He would see, he said, oh, you got Malcolm, who, you know, Malcolm X t-shirts. Mm -hmm. Or who is this character? Or you, you know, they would be making fun or joking, making jokes. And really, you know, just trying to really intimidate me or frighten me in a sense because I, I was here alone. So we did have some incidents that were frightening, mm -hmm. but, you know, we... We were in our community, so we just stayed and dealt with it. Mm -hmm. well, we, well, well, I tell you, we're definitely glad that you stayed and that you're still here. Well, what about currently? Is there is there any pushback currently, or has that subsided? Or how, how that uh, you know, you will in America. You will always have uh, racism. Mm -hmm. right? You'll mm -hmm. always have that privileged class of folks who don't want you here, mm -hmm. and it's okay. Even some of our own people, you know, you'll have that class of people who wish that we were not so so vocal in right. our Pan-African ideology, right? Or that we were a little bit more status quo. Mm -hmm. So you you have, it's, some people love you and some people don't. Would you say it's less, it's more than, than the back, is it less? Uh, is I would it less say it, it is definitely less, but okay. it is definitely okay. still okay. there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, well, look at, tell us about, so what's the goal of the venue? What's, what's the main goal? Well, for, well, you know, of course, my husband's goal, my late husband's goal was a little bit stronger than mine. I'm not him, and he ain't here. He left me here, so I said I have to do what I do. But uh, initially, uh, it was def definitely a space, an institution where people would come together, uh, able to, um, you know, learn more about Mother Africa, more about themselves, more about humanity, but definitely to come and... Uh, get closer to Mother Africa and to learn about what's going on in Africa, learn about imperialism, learn about socialism, learn about liberation struggles in Africa and how they got themselves out of those situations and so we can learn how we can get ourselves out of a certain level of, of oppression here in this country. So knowing that it's, we're all one as African people, you, we all suffer from the same problems no matter where we are around the world. Mm -hmm. We're facing the same enemy and we're suffering from the same problems. So. Well, you know, I, I, Christian, I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with the uh, shot. Well, what about uh, uh, African Americans with children? Well, what type of, because you want to learn these things, what, what, what do you have here in the shop that would look that? For the that? last 34 years, going on 35 years now, we have, you know, focused on the community as a whole. And primarily uh, children, well, we've done a lot of programs, we do a lot of programs for children because children need to know, uh, you know, that they came from greatness, right? Mm -hmm. They need to know they've done great things in the past. So they know they can do them today. Right. So we, we focus on the community families as a whole. We focus on the education, black history, culture, mm -hmm. African history. We focus on the health and wellness of our people. We teach, we've had beekeeping classes. We've had health co-ops and mm -hmm. forums. We've had, um, you know, gardening, farming. We've had just all kinds of exercise classes, all kinds of speakers. Uh, we've had uh, Spanish, Swahili, Swahili classes. We've had Chinese classes for okay. children here. Okay. <laughs> we've had, um, uh, it, you know, a lot of uh, STEM classes, science, math, and mm -hmm. uh, we've even had um, classes for adults, computer classes for adults uh, in, um, what is that thing? I forget what, which one it was. Mm -hmm. But anyway, just mm -hmm. uh, thousands and thousands of programs and activities. We're talking about those cards I saw in the front for Do you know those different learning cards that you have? Oh, knowledge cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, tell us about those knowledge cards and, and how do parents, how would they use those with their kids to have them learn? Well, let's see. Um, it's, it's just so many things in here. I mean, let me just, can I, I'll go there. Yeah, you But go let ahead. me just start that there's so many beautiful children's books that uh, are here with images of black children, you know, sh telling them mm -hmm. how beautiful their hair is, how beautiful their nose and lips are, how, how smart and intelligent and amazing they are. Mm -hmm. So there are so many beautiful books written today. And those knowledge cards are just there for adults and children okay. so that you can learn, because a lot of us don't know, don't right? Know a lot of the children sometimes are teaching the parents. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm saying uh, those are cards where you can learn about black history, 
you can learn about mad science, the, the solar system, you can learn about all of those things. So mm -hmm. knowledge parts are very important. Hey, you know, some, one of the most uh, heartening things I've seen today, if you have a, outside there, you have a food, I call it outside food pantry, mm -hmm. where you put food out where anybody in the community can come and pick it up. So how did that start and, and tell us the, well, we were doing this pre-pandemic. Okay. So actually, we started. We we've had um, we did it. Uh, we had what we call a food rescue. So every first Saturday, we would. This was probably about five years ago or more. But anyway, we've been doing it for a while. Where we give out fruit, free fruits and vegetables every first Saturday of the month, mm -hmm. and we would rescue food. Uh, these food. Um, these places, food distri distributors would give us food that they were going to throw away. And, of mm -hmm. course, a lot of food is good. Right, we just right, have right. to pick through the bad and throw right. away right. and keep the good. So we started that uh, years ago, and and we just kind of, it turned one, and one day a sister came to me and said, can I put a refrigerator out here? We have a, 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 a we want to call it the people's fridge. And I said, okay, that I can do that. Mm -hmm. So we started out with a small refrigerator and table. And... Um, and so we've been giving away, it's a 24-hour food pantry. It's really something that has us thinking outside of the box mm -hmm. of feeding people. For me, I don't want to feed people forever right, because right, it right. should be a short-term solution right, but uh, and not a long-term solution because this system has enough money, has enough housing, right. has enough everything to not, for there not to be any homeless or hungry folks, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm saying it's a it's a temporary solution. Hope we thought that we would end it after, you know, at a certain point, but uh, the need is still there. There are thousands of families that come here and give food, and the community donates the food. Even myself, I don't have to put any food out there. Mm -hmm. People come. Some of the food pantries that can't give away their food bring their food here. So we have people that come and donate food, but it's 24 hours, no questions asked. People drive up, put food, and go. And it's a uh, it's a cold storage fridge too, so that so that people can store cold food. And we may have to end it very soon because the new management here is wanting it to be gone. Oh, so, right. so we'll oh, see. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Well, that's well, that's uh, that's kind of unfortunate, but oh, but anyway, uh, but it's still great work until they stop you. Yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Ed, could you you know I asked you to uh, bring a piece or something to explain to us about. You sure did, did Some of your pieces here. Mm -hmm. Do you, you, you have anything you want? Uh, I, want I want somebody. I want them to. I want the audience to see yes. some of this beautiful stuff that you all have and I, something. I, I got plenty. I just don't want to get up and run nah. and get it. Well, will, you, will, will, will you just explain what's, what you got behind us right here? Oh, this is this is our. We have, we have not taken down our Kwanzaa uh, setup okay. <laughs> from, okay. from this uh, December. Okay. But of course, uh, Kwanzaa is a. We every year we do seven. Well, we do six days of Kwanzaa. We don't do the seventh day. Could you, could you explain what Kwanzaa is before you tell us about, about what you do? Mm -hmm. Kwanzaa is an, uh, a cultural holiday, mm -hmm. not a religious holiday, but a cultural holiday that begins December 26th and runs through January 1st. It was created by a brother named Milana Karinga, okay. uh, who was a former member of the US organization, but he was involved in the Black Power movement back in the 70s, 60s and 70s. But Kwanzaa was created in 1966, and it's a holiday for us to celebrate our African history and culture. Okay. You know, each day, uh, 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 each day you talk about a different principle that we should all collectively come together and try to, you know, live mm -hmm. for, which unity, self-determination, purpose, uh, collective work and responsibility, creativity, and faith, and all of these different principles that are a part of mm -hmm. our culture and are a part of the African personality. So it's really a time for us to come together and celebrate who we are. And, and all over the world, people on these same days and same times are on the same wavelength, right? We're, we're mm -hmm. giving thanks for where we are, reflecting on where we have to go, and remembering where we've come from. Now, has Kwanzaa uh, extended globally? Is it high, um, how deep it, is it in the diaspora? Is it high? It's very deep. Thousands of people all across the world, even in Africa now, are celebrating Kwanzaa. So okay. it's, it's, it's grown to just, you know, what we, no. oh, it's just grown tremendously. Uh, do you think that Kwanzaa will be able to uh, 
help or facilitate uh, the diaspora as we collectively hook up economically, culturally, and so forth, you think? That yeah, part of Kwanzaa's um, principles are cooperative economics, right, mm -hmm. which encourages African people to shop with other African people, African people to support other black businesses, right, our people to work together to create our own businesses because it's very important to have our own businesses. There was one point throughout of our, I mean, black business people after slavery who had their own businesses put their lives in danger because some of the white businesses felt like they were in competition and they would run you out or burn right. you down. So it was really, some people lost their lives just by trying to create their own business, create mm -hmm. their own economics. So it's very important for us to encourage people to start their own businesses, young people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of young people are doing so today. So I'm very proud, very happy to see so many young businesses starting at an early age mm -hmm. uh, these days. So yeah, it, part of Kwanzaa is to, for us to work together to build our own economics. As we do the, as we do the Pan-African Connection, what are some of the things that we can do to, without, without saying enough kind of way, with, how, how can we, as we hook this up, because what we don't want to do, we don't want, we don't want some of our cultural values we have that we've learned here, we don't want to take them over there. So what are some of the things we can do as we do this, do this transition, this connection, to uh, have our community understand that, look, as we hook up, uh, we want you, we need to go and learn the cultural stuff that you that we forgot because we were enslaved. How do we present that about people to have them understand that, 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 they, that they don't need to go crank after uh, we don't need after crunk up. Uh, so so <laughs> well, I think uh, I think we have more in common than we have different. Mm -hmm. And I think once you get together with people born on the continent, you'll see that. You know, look, we we're not so di we're really right, we're, right. we have very we have more in common than we have different. So I think we'll we'll uh, see eye to eye on many things. Mm -hmm. And like you said, uh, we we don't have all the answers. The people right, born in right. diaspora don't have all the answers, right. and that we can definitely learn from each other. We can both help each other. We we need some of the. Um, you know, we just, you know, but Mother Africa has to be primary. Right, right? It has right, to be first. Right. Uh, and that we definitely have to use whatever skills, resources, whatever we have to go and help build Mother Africa too. But uh, you're right. We, we can't go thinking we, we are this, you know, mm -hmm. we have all the answers because we don't. But collectively, there's nothing men and women cannot do. And Africa needs all hands on deck for sure. All hands mm -hmm. on deck. Uh, so culturally, you're saying that that, that, that that we need to do is basically need to, again, go over and learn exactly. what they're doing, and then, uh, you know. No, I, and see I, how we can help. Well, Even, I, mm -hmm. go, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that, uh, yeah, there's, if we travel to Africa a lot, and we do business with people in Africa, but Africa is still um, operated and controlled by they have black leaders, but a lot of them are what we call neo, neo colonialists, right? They are those that are still pushing the agenda of the original colonizers, right? right? Of Britain, France, uh, Portuguese, uh, all these different, you know, folks. But uh, so we have to, we definitely have to go in and just have an, uh, what we call a, just do some political education and let people know. We're going to talk about that. that. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But what I'd like you to address this, I would address, uh, you know, because we grew up when white people were telling us, you know, we couldn't even talk to Africans back when I was growing up. What they were telling us, hey, they don't like y'all. Then they're telling them over there, hey, they don't like y'all. So they're saying, hey, they don't like us. So what do we do to address some of that? And you know, what I tell, what I tell folks is this, I said, look, the people telling you that they don't like you, they don't like you. So why would you listen to somebody that don't like you tell you who don't like you? So, uh, you know, so the, but how we, what we do is we do this collective hookup. How do we address that issue to have people understand, hey, look, drop that. You know, don't let, no, don't let other people tell you 
how to pick your leaders. What do you say? How, how you gonna, how, how I you say the that? biggest threat to an unjust system is a unified people, right? Whenever somebody tells you, it's, it's all propaganda. They don't like you, you don't like them. They don't want you to come together. They don't want to see, they don't want you to see yourselves as one because collectively you are, you can't be stopped, right? Right. So it's, it's a divide and conquer technique. It's nothing new and we understand it. So uh, like you, uh, we, uh, we say no, whenever we, we give examples, you know, we are one people. Uh, we we again suffer from from uh, from uh, all over the world in Africa. There's low health care. There's uh, you know low job, no, low unemployment. There is uh, uh, you know there's uh, just mm -hmm. all of these things, and we the same companies are exporting Africa, are exporting right, us right, here. Right, right. So we we are one people suffering from the same problems, from the same enemy. And, uh, and, and again, the, a, 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 it, a unified people are hard to stop. So, yeah, of course, it's, it's divide and conquer. That's, that's simple. I think Jacob Hoover who said in, in the, you know, where they uh, leave those documents, he said, biggest threat to America is a unified black, black people. That's exactly. So I, think they, so I think he understood that, uh, you know, that we are, again, look, we're still here. Exactly. You know, after all that we've been through, so we're still here. So that's Now you talked a little bit, we were, and we're going to talk about some of that, uh, some of the dynamics that's open, uh, that's open after here in a minute. Uh, so again, but before we do that, I want to again talk about some of this beautiful art you got. You know, you have like so. So where you, uh, is, is this for sale, the art, the art on the wall? Uh, is some that for of sale? it is. That is. Some of it is. Some of it was painted by a, a brother artist in Dallas, passed away a while back, named Walter Wynn. He painted okay, some yeah. of the best portrait paintings of anyone. So he, he, he painted a lot of pictures for us. We sold a lot of them. And most of, all of his pieces are like collector's items now. No, ain't nobody selling them. If they, got, if they have Walter Wins in their home, they ain't selling them. So uh, a lot of these, some of these portraits were painting. Some of the the boys, mm -hmm. some of the King, the Malcolm X, the okay. Paul Roberson, the Mill Paul Cabral, the Harry Tubman's, uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Seiko Terrain. Some of these, pe these portraits were painted by him. So they're not for sale, they're, but they are for people to, to see and ask questions about. Now we have a lot, one of the largest collections of African art carvings mm -hmm. and things. I think, well, I don't know, but people tell me that mm -hmm. they've seen anywhere right. in this country right. in one spot. So the the wood carvings and things, of course, we use to tell stories and just remind people of their own symbols and and uh, their own strength. You know, when they walk through the doors, they see mm -hmm. statues that are smiling at them, tall, strong, uh, with their own symbols with their own uh, features so the African carvings are very important too they are because our stories were sometimes not written down but put in the art uh, you know it, 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 you know, this is kind of talking future business uh, in Africa what is the market for what we have I mean I know we have the commercial stuff, but is there a market for African-American art uh, so forth and so on in Africa, uh, it, uh, or, or is that a, a, a something to be developed? I think it's probably something that needs to be developed. A lot of time, a lot of people in Africa can't afford this type of these type these type of prices that people charge for art here in this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, there are not many bookstores in Africa because the people can't really afford to purchase books mm -hmm. at, because people don't don't make the kind of money to purchase a $20 book. You know, they may make $20 for the whole month. So yeah, I think uh, it is because of the, um, the economic conditions, uh, a lot of this, this market is not there. There are a lot okay. of people, there's people with money too, like people with money here mm -hmm. uh, and people without money, but uh, not as many people, uh, more people without than with. So yeah, that, that would be the only obstacle that I see mm -hmm. in incorporating some of the Things from here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so well, well, sure. There's something we got that we could market from our community. I'm trying to think. Can you think of anything? I don't know. That's a good <laughs> I, you know, for me, if I go to move to Africa today, mm -hmm. 
I'm trying to think what would I need from the states, right? right because right, right, right. I didn't, Africa has everything that you they, need. They do, they do, they do, they do. <laughs> and you breathe better, you eat better, you under mm -hmm. less stress, you don't have to worry about all these bills that you're paying. So I don't know what I would need, to be honest with you, okay. but other than to come back and see my family. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So, so as, we hook, as we hook this thing up, what's going to be the, the main benefits you feel that would be for the African American? And what do you think the main benefit would be for the Africans in Africa as, as we hook this collective? Oh my gosh. I mean, if we, uh, depend, if we go ahead and organize towards the objective of Pan-Africanism, uh, seeing ourselves... And we are. Go ahead. Exactly. Uh, seeing ourselves as one people, then we, many of us would, you know, one thing is that we were organizing towards under the All African People's Revolutionary Party is to help uh, form a United States of Africa, okay. where African people, no matter where they are, across the diaspora, in mm -hmm. the world, would be united under one governing body, right, well, of Africa, mm -hmm. not Nigeria, not Ghana, not okay. this place over here, but a united Africa, and we would fall under that umbrella as a sixth region of of Africa, so of uh, so it it we would have certain protections, certain sovereignties, right, under a United States of Africa, right. instead of you know because if you if you if, if somebody shoots somebody from China, mm. they don't hear about it from that from mm. those folks from that consulate from those from that government, Italy anywhere in the other place in the world, mm -hmm. you would have to answer to right, that right, country right, or that right. government body. So here, we don't have certain sovereignties or, mm. or protections of a power base right. right that can protect us. So, um, but yeah, United States of Africa is something we should definitely discuss. Well, that's a great segue into the continent because uh, I, I uh, the last year I've tried to educate myself about what's going on. There's a lot of things happening on the continent, uh, Africa was Africa. The continent was accepted into the G20, so now it's G21. Uh, currently, what's going on is uh, again some they're kicking some of these colonial coup leaders out, uh, uh, and they have they, they began to remove the uh, visa lines around the different states. So that's happening now, and so uh, because they. They've come to figure out that that when they broke them up into pieces like that and these them up like that, it made it hard for them to work together. So now they they're 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 moving toward the United States of Africa. Just FYI, uh, okay, Marcus Garvey, you know he the uh, W. E. Du Bois and a lot of cats. I mean, Crew and them and, and that crew in the '60s moved toward was moving toward the United States of Africa, and the CIA went over and killed everybody. From what I'm saying, True. from what I'm and so, and then later on, Gaddafi tried, and then they, they used the UN, went in and killed him. So now, what's going on now, from my, from my perspective, from my study, from what I'm going to watch currently, uh, this time what they're doing is they're leveraging BRICS, the economics of this, China, Russia, and so forth now, the economics that they're setting up against the West. So they're leveraging bad boys against bad boys. So this way, it's make it harder for them to come in and kill everybody like they normally do. Mm -hmm. So I'm, so I'm pleasantly, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm happy with the current direction of what they're doing, what they're trying to do. So what do you, so what do you expect on the continent? What, what do you see happening over there as far as the I think it's, uh, it's for us. We are definitely happy to see um, some of these countries like Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, uh, Ivory Coast. These countries stand up too the French, uh, stand up to Britain or stand up to some of these, mm -hmm. these former uh, co colonial powers, right? Uh, we're, we, it is still something we're waiting to see and to kind of, um, uh, you know, get more clarity mm -hmm. on. But I think we're all very happy mm -hmm. to see these young men um, and women stand up to these colonial powers. And, and as you said, they're leveraging Russia and China mm -hmm. because these are also power power sources mm -hmm. that the U.S. really don't want to 
mess with if right. they don't have to. Right. 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 So, and that's sometimes the only way you have protection, like you said, right. to have these these powers that possess nuclear weapons and you know the, who 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 can go toe to toe mm -hmm. with U.S. and U.S. and European imperialism. So. Right. Uh, definitely, but uh, it's very promising, and we're, right. we're still waiting to see uh, how it plays out. But it's it's very uplifting for sure. Well, uh, you know, like I say, you know, Africa is awakening. Well, what they said they've come to understand was that after all these years of colonialism and quote freedom, they found out that that all they did was they replaced the uh, Bible with democracy. And so what happened was they were coming over, they were voting with democracy, but all their money was going to Europe. So they were still coming over to Europe, coming over to Africa, taking raw materials out and stealing uh, raw materials, processing them and making money off of them. Also, had their money, had their money in, uh, go to the French banks. So they were actually had to borrow their own money, plus they were stealing from them. So basically what they decided was, they said, you know what, and then they tried to immigrate to those places and they say, no, nah, we don't want y'all over here. They said, wait a minute, we're the ones that got all of and then, but we're poor. So they finally figured it out that they don't need the Europeans. So that's, so they began to kick them out. Uh, and, and, and what I would say to the African Americans here in America is that we have as a as community, two point, okay, first of all, American GDP is $21 trillion. We have a, uh, uh, 2.5 African American, 2.5 trillion dollars spending power. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and when I would say to our African American leaders, uh, 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 why you all aren't fighting to, for us to have access to that 2.5 trillion dollars where we can scale ourselves? So we're actually in the same position that the Africans are in. It's the same. In other words, we've been colonialized within. You know the system. So, what do you think about that, and, and what are some of the uh, things they do about that, as far as like, you know, education or whatever? Yeah, I think it's uh, very important for us to keep up with what's going on on the continent, right? Because uh, these are our brothers and sisters, right? And um, and we we have to support them, right? And I think one thing, one good thing about social media is that it has gotten a lot of information out there about what's going on on the continent. And uh, so more and more people are sort of, you know, more informed than they used to be, especially mm -hmm. now, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, and as you said, Europe would be nothing without the resources of Africa. So there's more and more political education going on right now about how all of these resources in the Congo and Sudan and uh, you know all of these these natural resources that people that these that French right. express France especially right, yeah. uh, are taking out of Africa she said going to France refining them and then making money mm -hmm. off of them yeah. so it's just uh, the people don't benefit at all only a few people small percentage of the African elite are benefiting from all of that money mm -hmm. and uh, things are uh, being made from the African resources, so um, we just have to do our part. This right. program you're talking right. about here at the Pan African Connection, uh, we have to just continue to you know, offer education of, about you know the current state of Africa. Mm -hmm. the, they have a group over in Africa called ECOWAS. That's that's the economic group. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's in what, 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 West Africa. But anyway, mm -hmm. it's an economic group, supposedly for the development of mm -hmm. Africa. Da, da, da. Uh, but when, but when uh, Niger and Malinam changed leadership, France tried to make get ECOWAS, which is an economic organization, to go start a fight with everybody else. I was very pleased to see that they didn't go for it this time. They they didn't let them just they didn't just go start fighting. Uh, you know, so I think that was a that's a big move. Uh, and, and so I, I, I think that's kind of for a for a lot of better things since they didn't do that. But of course, they're still having to work their way through it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. some of them are, are, are still, you know, they hold on to their colonial peace. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but again, like Ghana, Ghana, I think yesterday, they mm -hmm. decided to uh, remove their visa lines mm -hmm. also. So, and then, I mean, so it's what just, do you think about that? I mean, it's, it's, it's a trend. We knew it was coming. A lot of the 
uh, countries kept the visa requirement for economic benefits, right? Mm -hmm. But places like Senegal, they not had a U.S. visa requirement. South Africa has not had a U.S. visa requirement. Mm -hmm. So Ghana is now lifting it. They're, they're hopefully soon it will be done. No, I mean between the countries, between Africa. Oh, is it between Africa? Oh, I, I thought continent. it was between. No, 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 within the continent. Oh, okay. I think I read somewhere yesterday they were going to, uh, if you're traveling from the U.S., you wouldn't need a visa right, either. Right, right, right. So that's good. So it's a good thing. And then some countries like um, Sierra Leone, if, if you take your DNA test and it shows you are from these Medicaid mm -hmm. people or... They'll give you actual a, a passport, you know. Okay. They'll make you a, a citizen of that country. So uh, it's a lot is changing. So it, I don't think it'll be long before we will have dual citizenship to a lot of these countries. So that would be really good. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, dual, yeah. Uh, what about the, what do you think about the, okay, like that's playing out over there. You notice there's none of it on the news over here. Exactly. So, so what are we, what are, which is why we're doing this show, where we can start to educate people. But what can we do more to, uh, you know, uh, create a Pan-African attitude within our uh, community? I think uh, there are very few places that it's going to come from. Uh, it's going to come from institutions like this, mm -hmm. who have an understanding and a foundation in Pan-Africanism, who understand that our connection to Mother Africa and our, our, uh, you know, our understanding mm -hmm. the uh, his history and the political struggles of Africa and all these systems that have been exploiting Africa and these, uh, you know, we, we have to understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that takes uh, some educational classes, right? Mm -hmm. And social media, it can definitely be a big help also uh, in pushing uh, certain information. So. It's going to take an organized effort from those that understand to have study groups and things of that nature to make sure people have a solid understanding and to de can and can defend, um, uh, you know, their positions against imperialism, explain imperialism, mm -hmm. this dominant force uh, of corporations and of uh, you know mm -hmm. entities that come in of the ruling elite come in and exploit. Mm -hmm. countries for their resources and and so yeah it's going to take a organized effort of political mm -hmm. political education and study groups I think one of the one of those this show is going to be to uh, you know we have a large African population here in the Metroplex area been here and they've been here for years but yet there's no real uh, connection between because you know the, the, you know you got you know, got different people Ethiopia and Somalia and uh, but there's no although we all have some Africans in our family have married some of them, but there's really no uh, deeper connection with the, between. So, how, so what can we do to, uh, you know, grow that and make that more? I think um, uh, we can. Um, you know, that's a tough one because yeah, it is. It is uh, although here in this space is probably one space where we do have a large number of people born on the continent come in and uh, you know talk and. But uh, it's just that the the overall society keeps us separated. They mm -hmm. keep uh, people in their own groups. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll say, well, don't come to this part of town because you might get killed or, you know, don't go. So uh, most people stay in, uh, in their own different ethnic well, groups. Well, 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 I, guess what I'm, uh, I guess what I'm actually asking, I'm asking about, uh, you, you know, when you immigrate to America, uh, I don't care what color you are, because we're in a caste system. There's a book out called Caste. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we're in a caste system, and so, regardless, you know, they're going to gravitate toward wanting to be white, and so that means, in our in the Africans' case, they kind of have to start hating themselves. To, I think, the separation part of the reason they have interacted more is because, you know, they just feel like, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to. Well, a lot of times the organizations that help them get here are not us. And these organizations will sort of guide their actions. Okay, you know, this is the school you're going to go to. This is the church you're going to go to. Okay, this like, is okay, what you're going like. to. So you, you are, mm -hmm. in, just to be here, your allegiance has to be to certain uh, organizations and, and people that help you get here. 
And so that I think that's for a minute. That's 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 it. You know, the system you described was like, like I remember. I'm old enough to remember when uh, 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 Drew Pearson and, and all the cowboys they stayed in the community, and then when the big money came. They start, and, and I know some players, I've talked to some NFL players, they say that they are guided toward white women. You know, I remember, you know, once, once uh, Mark, Mike Irvin, his crew got here, they quit, they quit living in the community. They started living out north, and they've been out there ever since, mm -hmm. you know, but before. And so it's kind of the same system that they're under. You know, they're not pro football players, but it's on the same system. Uh, somebody brought them in, they're guiding them on where to go, who to like, who not to like. Yes. So how do we break through that? So even they, I mean, I don't know that we can unless we offer the, some of the same programs and benefits that these other organizations are offering people, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes... Well, what exactly do they do? Well, I mean, you say... These I mean, organizations, right? sometimes they help you get here to this country, okay. right? Uh, so you can say you were going through a lot of things wherever you come from, so mm -hmm. these organizations will help you find help They'll bring you to America, help you find help or help you connect with family members here. But you definitely have to, you know, go by mm -hmm. certain rules. Mm -hmm. You may even have to sign, I, ain't, I, I will do this, I'm against this. So I'm saying there, there are certain um, strings attached sometimes mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that you, and you have to play by their rules at times. Yeah. You can't say, you can't come over here and mm -hmm. talk about revolutionary uh, right, stuff. Right, right, right. Yeah. You really have to keep a low profile and in order to keep whatever benefits that you have. It, it's anecdotal, but you know, a lot of people don't know that there's a Nigerian community down in Tyler, 6,000 strong, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, one of my friends was telling me that, one of them told them one time that, uh, you know, that, that, that they were smarter than African Americans. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, I think that's part of when they come over in that system, they're being told that same thing. And so we're gonna have to work really hard to uh yeah you know, and we 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 know there's a lot of misinformation and and division and propaganda put out there so yeah we definitely have to push back against a lot of that yeah yeah so uh, it, and again i you know hopefully this show will, will you know would be a part of that going forward because i'd like to you say you know quite a few uh mm -hmm, we do. and so i think that what we could probably do what i'm gonna suggest with this uh, format that you and I are going to be doing is that we, you know, have those discussions and, you know, start you know, start that dialogue because this Africa change, what we don't want is for the people over here to not accept the change and then we have to fight them over here, right, while we're trying to go over there. Uh, uh, I, I, I think her name is Akima. She's an ambassador to uh, the Schwarzer Basket for ECOWAS. Mm -hmm. They're putting together a program uh, to help facilitate, because the Africans, again, I posted lots of apologies and all this stuff to African Americans, so, but what they want, they want to work with African Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, and, and so what Ms. Akeem is doing, she's putting together a program with it, and, and hopefully we're hooking up with her and so forth. She put together a program to, I guess, because see, we want to do good business with each other. We got, okay, we got scammers on both sides. Let's be, you know, you can have scammers on both sides. So, so but we need to set up a process, infrastructure, where we can actually do business with each other uh, and know who we're doing business with. So, uh, so as we do that, uh, we're going to have to, again, you know, more, more, more education, you know, and so forth and so on. Uh, well, hopefully, uh, in the near future, you know, uh, as things change here in America, Maybe, uh, well, not maybe. It will. It'll, it, it will impact how they look at us over there. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But my biggest piece is the cultural. It's the cultural piece. We're going to have to again. We've got to work hard with that because again, I don't want to go to Africa and think I'm in Dallas. That's you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, so, so we got to work. We got to work really hard on that one. So. Uh, so is there anything else you want to talk to us about that that, that I may not have, uh, uh, you know, thought of that you say, say, you know, I really want to tell the people about this mm -hmm. right here? No, I think I'm just uh, very thankful for the discussion and and I know and I have faith that, uh, you know, some people say, 
you know, we'll never come together, we'll never, but no, shut up, I won't tell them to shut up, because mm -hmm. we are coming together, there's more unity than disunity among our people, and that there's nothing man and woman cannot solve collectively, together, and that we are winning, and we, and we just have to know we're winning, and we right. have to go with our, our ancestors, and our, our, our culture tells us to go what to go with what was in the beginning and what will be in the end. In the beginning, there was good, there was God, everything was good. So we have to have faith to know that that will also be in the end. In the end, we're going to win. And we're winning, so I'm, we're I'm just... We're exchanging a few isms. Okay. You know, uh, uh, okay, like, like I said, like when people say one accord, Hey, we need all to get on one accord if you don't want to. And what I try to tell them is, is that, no, there's only the cord you're on. There is no one accord. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to wait for one accord, that means you're not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. You're just saying, I'm not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. so my ism is, you know, don't, you know, don't get caught up in the one accord because there is really, it's only your accord connected to the other accords. Mm -hmm. There is no, quote, one accord because mm -hmm. we're all, you know, we're all different. We're all in different stages of life. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you only know what you know. They only know what they know. Don't get upset with folks because they don't know what you know. If they don't know what you know, you got to educate them on what you know. So don't get upset with them. You know, and, and understand that you don't know anything either. We're on a learning journey. Exactly. We'll be learning. There's only two, uh, my, my ex-husband, my late husband says there's only two people that know it all, God and a fool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Say a fool think they know everything. So we, we don't know it all. So, uh, mm -hmm. so, so give me a, a ism. Well, a I know ism? you can yeah, well, you know, I'm kind of like just... You mean something that... Yeah, that, you know, that, that that's profound, but yet, you know, you go by it still, you know, there's something that you go by. I don't know. You might, I might have to think about that one. Oh, no, you ain't got to think about it. You know, you know, you... Something that I go by. You are profound. You mean, okay. You are profound by just having all of this. Okay, well, I, I appreciate that, because I need to hear that every now and then, because it's mm. like, like I say, it is... Uh, it's a challenge, but, but you have to keep pushing. So what's been your greatest days? Uh, you, I'm sure you've had a lot of great days, because I've seen a lot of programs you've had come through here. Mm -hmm. But what is, what's been your greatest day since you've been here? Since you've been here? Uh, you know, it's, there are always days like uh, when our people are all come together. Juneteenth is always a special time. Okay. Uh, because especially now since they passed it as a national holiday, mm -hmm. you know, everybody is celebrating Juneteenth, and um, and it's a time where our people are excited, and uh, not just about Texas, but mm -hmm. just about us. It's just another day that we can celebrate ourselves. And of course, we have a huge Malcolm X Festival mm -hmm. every year, uh, where we our people come together, celebrating one of the greatest African men and thinkers of our times, Brother Malcolm X. So, well, what do you say to people? Juneteenth, I'm talking about. Well, what do you say to people that be saying? Y'all didn't know y'all was free. What do you say, folks? Okay, first of all, let me say this. Uh, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1, 1863. The war was still going on. Nobody was free. Now, the war, the last battle of the Civil War, actually was in 1868. Okay, so, uh, you know, basically, Hey, like that's what that is. So how do how do how do you say? So my cousins up north, they seem to think they was free before we were free. So hey, how do you address? You know, there are some people who don't celebrate Juneteenth. They, they don't think it's important. Mm -hmm. And I may have been one of those in the past, right? Who mm -hmm. said, "Well, why are we celebrating that we got our freedom two years? You know, we got this information late. That's nothing to celebrate." But you know, for people who are not free, who are still fighting for certain freedoms. And uh, we need to, I take this day and I'll celebrate it and use it to, to do whatever we can to educate them and, and get our people closer to where we need to be. So we use it as a tool to organize and educate our people. Well, what I try to tell them is, just like right now, if I ain't free, you ain't free. True. So if you thought you were free, I don't know why. 
And if you thought you were free on January 1, 1863, then why don't you celebrate that day? You know? I mean, I know why we eat peas. See, that's why we eat black eyed peas and so forth, and good luck and all that. You know, folks don't even know why they're doing it. They just be eating, right? So, <laughs> you know, how good luck and so forth and so on. But, but like I say, but those, okay, the Malcolm X, like the Malcolm X, uh, tell us a little bit about that day that you have here. Yeah, well, we've been uh, doing a Malcolm X festival. We don't do it here. We don't. We first started out, well, before we came over here. But we've been doing it for, for a while, and uh, it's a huge celebration. We have at different locations, uh, but it's a huge, huge, huge event. We have live bands, live performers, lots of vendors, speakers. But it's a big community day because uh, some of the people don't want you to recognize Brother Malcolm, but Malcolm was a a very transformative, revolutionary figure in, in our history. And one of the books that I encourage people to read uh, is the Autobiography of Malcolm X because that one book will change your whole life and have you reading 300 more books after that. So it, it's a huge festival we have every year at the end of May. So it's, okay. it's a beautiful day. Okay, well, I'll well, make sure I finish here uh, because we'll get close to the end of the show. Uh, South America, the we're talking about the diaspora. South America. Uh, well, what's your? Do you, you have you had any diaspora contacts in South in South America? Uh, uh, well, as you know, African people, our people are taken all over this place to the uh, Caribbean islands, to Latin America. You know, if you go to Colombia, you go to Haiti, you mm -hmm. go to uh, Dominican Republic, you go to. Nicaragua, you go to all these different places, mm -hmm. you see us. Right, right. So our people are scattered all around the world, and um, and we have to, you know, they may speak Spanish, mm -hmm. but they're us, and they they understand their lineage and mm -hmm. their heritage is from Africa. Cuba, you know, you go to Cuba, you see mm -hmm. our people. So I'm just saying, our people are scattered all around the world, and we just have to recognize that they are African people. We, we were just dropped off here in the mm -hmm. Americas. They were dropped off there. So, uh, but we are all one people scattered in many places, we're speaking many different languages. Mm -hmm. so. The one thing about the uh, Dominican Republic, and from what I'm saying, some, some, country, some places in Africa, you know, they still bleaching. It's true. Uh, for folks that don't know what bleaching is, uh, back in the day, when 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 you know in the supremacy system, folks want to be white, mm -hmm. even black folks. So they had like OJ beauty lotion and some other things that you could use to bleach your skin. I remember we go to, I remember we come back from the, you know, you go to summertime, you know, you're working in the fields, so, so you're supposed to come back darker. And then I would come back, to school. I hear my aunt and them talking, my old aunts. Mm -hmm. Ooh, wee. she bleached. <laughs> you know, so. So how do we, so you know we're going to encounter, you know. Well, there's a lot of self-hatred, right? Uh, All, even here in America, people use skin lightening creams. So uh, it's, it's just this, this level of self-hate that we have to, um, to fight against. And, and that black is beautiful, and, all, and African people come in all shapes and colors. Even some of us are lighter than light in, in, in Africa and have never had any contact with any Europeans. So we're, we are, we come in all colors and we're beautiful mm -hmm. no matter what color we are. And as a matter of fact, in Ghana they had anti-bleaching campaigns to encourage people not to bleach their skin, women especially, because men are not doing it, it's mostly for the women because they think it makes them more attractive, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they get more attention if they are lighter skin. So colorism is a thing mm -hmm. that we need to discuss. Right. I don't like to focus on it a lot right, right, right. because... Um, I don't think it's our primary uh, struggle, our primary struggle, but it definitely uh, creates a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, right. identity issues. Yeah, and like I say, and I'm like you, I don't want to focus on it either, but I, but, but but I do think we need to focus, focus on educate our people on what exactly is melanin and what does melanin do. And so melanin, melanin has a property to it. And so that's what we're not educated about. I think we were educated about the properties of melanin. I mm -hmm. think that uh, you probably see less bleaching if they understood, uh, you know, what it actually was, what it actually is. And I think, uh, you know, and all people have melanin. 
white folks got melanin. They just don't have as much as we do. But I'm just saying, we all have melanin. But I think for us, it is a, we've just been taught, uh, you know, white supremacy has done a number on us all around the world. And mm -hmm. we're still fighting right, against right. certain traumas and certain self-afflictions and uh, just certain mm -hmm. well, things I, that we have to work through even today. Well, mm -hmm. well, well you come, you know, you come close to the end of the show. I just want to say that basically, you know, I like to tell people that African Americans, uh, we are in an abusive relationship with white America, and we have all the symptoms of an abused spouse. Mm -hmm. And we're in an abusive relationship. And so basically, you know, we're going to have to use some of the techniques uh, that an abused spouse would use to get away from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that abusive spouse. So, uh, you know, we got a lot of work to do. I think that uh, the changes I see happening now, I think we're going to see some, some things happen. I, I believe that last shall go first. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just want our people to, you know, hold on to that. And just basically just uh, stay in the present. You, you know, be present, be, be, be right now. Whatever you're going to plan for the future, plan it right now in the present. Don't be, don't, don't talk, don't talk about it. You got to have some action to go with the words. So, uh, you, you got, I uh, don't hear any kind of last words, any last thoughts you have just to close out the program. Do you have any? Uh, last thoughts or something. We need to hear something. Uh, if, if, if you, I feel I sing something in that. Oh, please. <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing. But no, I'm just, uh, again, I, um, I have faith uh, as we've always been taught. Mm -hmm. And I am a praying woman. I have, you know, and I, I not only do I pray, but I move my feet. You know, faith without works is dead. As mm -hmm. you said, we have to act. We have to uh, but we have to have we have to be organized. We have to come together, knowing what we're organizing for, why we're doing it, and uh, who, you know, what we're for and what we're against. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely, we have to be more organized. So I encourage people to organize, agitate, organize. Right. So organization is the key, and the key of like key to life is to have no fear. So we have to be courageous, like Dr. King taught us, to go against those very challenging things of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, dogs. I'll, one thing Dr. King taught us is to is to be courageous and mm -hmm. to move forth in courage. So I encourage people to uh, to to understand that the key to life is to have no fear. Right, and yeah, just pick it back on that. Just remember uh, the power only have the power over you because it's because of your fear. You lose your fear and they lose their power. They have no power here. Mm -hmm. I quit that. It, it's just great talking to you. Oh, well, uh, and thank I look you. forward I to it. And I look forward to doing uh, you know some more shows because what we want to do is educate people yes, sir. Uh, about the diaspora. And so, uh, uh, and, and so that, uh, that was it for you. You don't have. You sure ain't got That's one more word. That's it for me. Away? I'm, I'm, I'm done. It's, it's all on you now. <laughs> okay. Well, this is Arthur Fleming, uh, Civil Rights Today present. Uh, thank you. Until next time. Thank you.